Okay, great. I'd like to call this meeting of the select board to order. Uh, it looks like I've got 6.02 p.m. First order of business is to look at the meeting minutes from January 31st. Do I have any comments None on those meeting me. minutes? None from me either. Okay. I'll second. Okay, great. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? And since I'm remote, we need to do it by roll call. So, uh, Julie? Yes. Fred? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Okay, very good. Um, second item is vendor and payroll warrants. Um, do I have any comments? <clears throat> no comments here. No comments here. Okay, great. Um, the third item is public comment. This is where we are invite those who are here to um, speak if they like. We will listen to comments from the public related to items not <clears throat> listed on the agenda. So is there anyone who would like to speak during the public <clears throat> comment period? May I just ask for the people on Zoom that if you're not speaking to just mute yourself until you're ready to speak, please? That's all, thank you. Okay. Okay, great. It doesn't look like I have anybody. I'm not seeing any hands on the Zoom. Um, I'm not seeing, um, maybe I better pin that window so I can see it a little bit better. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing, there's one person in the room who doesn't seem to be raising their hand. Okay, um, the first item is a utility pole hearing. Um, there's a petition to install and maintain underground lines for the transmission of electricity from Western Massachusetts Electric Company doing business as Eversource in the area of the intersection of River Road and Straits Road in Waitley. So um, I imagine I either will toss to Brian or ask um, for Eversource's representative to say something. Is there? Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm Jesse Martin. I'm representing Eversource tonight. Um, you have any okay. questions about what we're trying to trying to accomplish? So does this involve any polls? It does involve one new poll. Um, due to the way uh, we need to continue the circuit that comes um, that comes up. <clears throat> well. Sorry, lost my, I got any... the map open, I lost it. Yeah, yeah, I think we've got a, like a four page document where the fourth page is a map. Yep. So um, the the, the lines that. that continue north south down um, down River Road. Um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought there. Um, it, due to the way that they're going to cross the road, we need to install one new pole to join them um, over to Straits Road, and uh -huh. um, and that's about. It. And then you can see on the map there we're going to install a, a vault there for access to the underground that uh -huh. goes through the farmer's field there. Okay, and this is all happening in the town's right of way? Yes. Okay. Well, maybe I should uh, let my colleagues have first crack at this. Um, Julie and Fred, do you have anything you want to? I, I don't see any houses there. The, will there be any disruption? to any driveways or any nope. sort of access? No. Nope. Nope, uh, I mean, the, you know, it. most of that is already, there's, it's existing. There's already um, cables that go underground um, through that property. We have an existing easement and everything. Um, this is just, the, the, the work is being, the, the petition, and the work as far as the manhole and the, the pole to connect is because we need to install uh, larger cables to be able to support the increased demand that's happening. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so, so really it's all, it's already in place. It's just going to be upsized. Um, it doesn't, mm -hmm. and the, the manhole gives us a new, um, 
the new point of access to the cables and and that's about it. It's really it's really pretty pretty straightforward. Mm. Okay. How I'm about just, you, Julie? I'm trying to coordinate the uh, the key with the tiny, tiny, tiny little poles that are on the uh, drawing. Um, yeah. I think I've made sense out of it. I don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Joyce, we have a hand raised. I have a hand raised. Um, uh, yeah, that part of my screen is not visible. So whoever is raising your hand, could you please go ahead and speak up? It's the gentleman that's here in person. Yes, I oh. think for the mention of a new pole installation, I was just wondering where the new pole is to be installed. Oh, well, um, would anyone in the room be willing to share their map with? Uh... Looks to me, I'm going to walk over there. Looks to me like it's. Here is installed that resource pole. Yeah. It's an existing joint pole. Existing Correct. Joint pole. Yep. Yeah. Everything else is existing except for the manhole. Yeah. Just the only things that'll be installed is that one new pole on the corner and the and the manhole. Yeah. Sir, may I just have your name? And your address? Well, I will be probably more flat than the road. 105. Reserve. Oh, thank you. Oh. Um, well, I have to say, I, mean, I don't really want to stand in the way of uh, someone who needs an upgrade for demand reasons. Um, I assume there's a farm business there that may be using more than um, than they were before, or whatever has changed about their operation, because that that's that's all fine um I, but i guess one of my my questions is we we have not approved any new polls since we started having trouble getting the double poles taken down all over town yeah we've gone to the we've gone to our state rep and our state senator we have had a meeting where eversource and Verizon and Comcast were all in the same room and they all swore up and down that there was gonna they, there's gonna be movement on these double poles and they're they we're gonna take care of those. And in the meantime, there's like 10 more new double poles somehow that we that weren't even on the survey. Maybe they're not new in the sense that they happened, they already existed and they just weren't counted in anybody's accounting. Okay. Um, so I guess my question for you is what are you willing to do to get some of the other double poles taken down in town? Because so we've, we've basically been rejecting any poles until we yeah, get I some understand. action on the double poles. And so I, it's your chance to argue that, that you're going to help us get those double poles taken down. I can certainly try. Um, you know, I, I'm the point of contact for a lot of customers and for, um, you know, a lot of customers and a, and a lot of, um, I don't know what else to say, like, um, like townspeople, um, you know, back to operations. Um, and I can reach out to them and, and see where we stand on things. Um, I don't know who specifically is involved in those projects, but I know who to reach out to to find out. Um, oh, it, but Eversource initiated it in, yeah. I believe, all of the cases. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we generally tend to hear is that Eversource says, well, you know, Comcast and Verizon, they have to move their lines before we can, yeah, can they do. do this. But there's there's no motivation for these other companies to move their lines. Mm -hmm. um, if they are already moved and the poll is ready to come down, then that's great. The Department of Public Utilities, we've tried getting help from them. And, well, you know what they're like. Um we, you know, we, we, we only, the only lever we have is to not let new polls go up. That's the yeah, only yeah, piece of, of leverage we have at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the customer who wants to get more power. So it's not just one customer. These, these, uh, these cables are actually the ones that cross the river to the substation. So this feeds all of Whaley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, 
Yes. So, so I'm, you know, even if it were just one customer, I'm sympathetic to that as well. Sure. sure. Um, so I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we can vote on this at our next meeting and see what kind of progress can we get somebody's commitment in writing that they're going to do something. Okay. Hey, I'm, I'm good with it, especially, you know, you contact Verizon. I understand that they actually own the polls and would probably be most responsible ultimately for getting rid of the double. Yeah, yeah, they would be. Um, so it goes electric is at the top and then um, Verizon and then the communication. So it's like, you know, it, it literally works on a ladder and everybody's got to got to get their stuff shifted over. So it doesn't really matter. I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but uh, it doesn't matter as much who owns the pole as it does that everybody's moved off of it and then it can go be removed, you know. Yeah, well, clearly it's important to you and to the town that this upgrade get done. And the quickest way for get done is to get some movement on those poles. Okay. Yep. Yeah, that's, I understand, you know, I understand where you're coming from. I can, I can mm -hmm. certainly reach out and uh, try to see what kind of progress I can make in the next, you know, I don't know when your next meeting is, two weeks or a month? Mm, two weeks, probably. Mm -hmm. um, Jesse, what's your title? I'm sorry, Jesse, what's your title? Yeah, Field Engineering what's... Designer. Okay. And do you have any clout with, you know, who might move the polls? <laughs> a, a little bit, a little bit. A little I have, bit. I have um, some inside help from Verizon. Okay, that would that okay. would be helpful. Um, Brian, do you have a? Um, I think there was there was in an email earlier this oh. week. I think. Do you happen to know off the top of your head how many double polls we have around town? And I would say all of these have been here for a year or more. Okay, I'm having trouble hearing Brian. Are you hearing Brian? He's having trouble with his internet, so he... yeah, yeah, Joyce, okay. can you, can you yeah. hear me now? Oh, yes. just heard you. Yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah, my internet's a little shaky. Um, it it's going to vary. Um, I think at one point there was 55 on the list plus the 10 that weren't on the list. I think there's been some movement recently um, to take some of the double poles down on Christian Lane as they continue to, you know, chip away at that. Um, but I don't, I don't, I don't think that we have a inaccurate up-to-date count. Okay. But, but it's I would a guess it's, 50 to 60 poles at this point. That's, that's, I think we were starting with 55 at one point um, mm -hmm. plus the 10. So, I mean, even if they took half of those down, we're in the whatever 20s or 30s, you know. Right. And these are not things that were just done in the last three months. They're supposed to do this within 90 days. And some of these, I'm we've been talking about this for, I feel like, three years. Yeah, I I remember. So uh, Whaley was, was part of my territory back when I started three years ago. And I remember hearing about this. So yeah, I, I can sympathize with you guys that... You know that you want some action yeah and then my other map um just for what it's worth uh, so we have two different maps and they're not entirely accurate um as far as showing which who owns which poles but the ones i'm looking at right now are shown as verizon pole. they own the pole as a whole so i also know that verizon has been very overwhelmed this last summer with projects um expansion and and ashfield a whole entire new circuit was put up uh, etc i could go on but so maybe, you know, even if they had been removed to the to the level where it's just the stub of the pole and be ready to be taken out, and probably hasn't been able to get back to it because they, they've had so much work going on this summer. Um, right. Well, and, I mean, we, we have to be on. I, I think it's got to be important enough for them to get us on this list. Yeah, everybody's busy. I'm busy. Yeah. But I've got to put the things that need to be done on my list and get them done. And I'm not saying that it's more important than 
I mean, it, I I can't necessarily yeah. judge whether one project is more important than another, but if they took out these poles, how much would that delay another project? And would that delay would not mean, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I, I'm sure they have their bottom line in mind and they want to prioritize projects that get services out to people who will pay them money. Um, but this has got to get done too. And we have to somehow get in the, uh, in the loop. And if you can help us do that, I think that would be really great. I can certainly try. Um, unfortunately, they're not really going to give me much leverage because uh, uh, they, the only reason I'm in this position is because this is a single poll that Verizon won't be on. It'll be our poll. So they don't really care. <laughs> But I'll reach out to them anyway. Okay, if you can reach out for them and get whatever mo motion you can get going on that, that would be really great. I'll see what I can do. Thanks. Offer to bake some cookies. <laughs> <laughs> that never works for me. I always eat them all. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, and then uh, right. can we put this on our next... Um, uh, agenda next week or next uh, meeting, which I believe is, it's not exactly two weeks away. I believe it'll be Tuesday of the yeah. week, two weeks from now. So 12 days from now. Do you want to continue the hearing? Um, sure. Sure. And that'll be a time and date place certain. Okay. Time date then, place. Um, I would move that we continue this hearing to our next meeting, which is February, February 28th, sorry. February 28th uh, at, uh, let's call it 6.05 p.m. because that's usually the public hearings are at 6.05. Is that, uh, that's a motion. Second. Uh, all of those in favor, Julie? Yes. Fred? Yes. Me? Yes. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Martin. All right. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Okay. Well, our next uh, appointment is not until 625. I don't know if the folks involved are actually here uh, already. We're on the line if you can hear us. Oh, so you're the 781. Yeah. Yeah, uh, number there. Two four and, one. Uh, two, five, five. And this, this is, is Nick Spagnola. Okay, thank you, Nick. No problem. Um, all right. Um, so, would you have any objection for us taking this up five minutes early? No, absolutely not. Okay. Okay, great. So, um, Mr. Spagnola, and uh, is Mr. Sokol there as well? Believe so. He may be on the line. Um, but if not, it's not not a problem. I'm okay. All right. Because I see a go. PJ, I see a Taylor, and I see a Phil, uh, but I don't see um, anyone that <laughs> I would no. see. Nope. It's probably not on yet. Nope. It's okay, okay though. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so you're here to discuss uh, future plans with the property at 226 State Road. So why don't yep. you go ahead? Um, all righty. So um, hello. And uh, I, we did want to provide an update on uh, 226 State Road, castaways, future plans for the property. Um, in the near term, we, we do have to plan to reopen and have a, a target date of reopening within the next 60 days. But um, over the last uh, 30 days or so, we've, we've come to terms with Shine Diamond LLC to purchase their provisional license that was uh, issued to them by the CCC with the goal of moving uh, their cannabis license, purchasing their cannabis license and then and moving it to 226 State Road and opening up uh, a recreational dispensary. Um, our goal would be to operate a topless dispensary and to remove new dancing and alcohol from the license. Um, basically the, the old castaways and, and castaways as is, as a, as a strip club would, would be no more. Um, 
And the, the one twist on it that would somewhat maybe keep this, the spirit alive a little bit of Castaways is, is to have a fully functional and operating topless dispensary. The, the license, from what I'm told, is is uh, is transferable. I think we we do need approval from the town. I, I think Shine Diamond did sign the host community agreement. Happy to uh, assume the responsibilities there or renegotiate. But this is just kind of a big picture idea. Just wanted to put it out there for for feedback, and um, yeah, just get some get some feedback on uh, moving the, the cannabis license to to two two six State Road, operating a dispensary, and, and even having a, a topless dispensary. Do we have documentation for the uh, cannabis license for the? Shine Diamond LLC. I do, I, in my possession right now, no. I'm waiting on uh, their due diligence file, but so far everything is, has checked out. I know they did sign the host community agreement. Mm -hmm. um, no reason to believe that there's no provisional license. Um, I'll have a due diligence file that's complete probably within the next 24 hours or so. We've, we've agreed to purchase their provisional. Okay. And if I remember right, their um, their plans were to move into um, uh, what what I think of as the the little plaza that used to have a Franklin First Credit Union in it. <laughs> um, I think the, the last address was 85 State Road, but I'm not. I'm not really sure if they were. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I may be confusing it with uh, with another one. Um, there have been many, many that have come through, and many of them have not gotten through the state level. So. Yep. Okay. Totally. So, Toro Verde. I have to uh, go remind myself where they were going to be. Um, and so <laughs> transferring the yeah. license and changing the address. Um. I wonder what um, does it, and Brian, do you happen to know with this uh, trigger having to go before the planning board again? Uh, we can't hear you, Brian. How about now? Now we can hear you. All right. Uh, I would think it would be a change of use. So I think they would have to go through, you know, go for a special permit for the ZBA. Yeah. Oh, ZBA, not planning board then. Okay. Um, so we're not really the last word on any of this anyway, but your um, purpose tonight is to sort of get some feedback from us about what we think. Is that... Correct. Okay, yeah, statement. I just wanted to, to put it into the universe, put it out there, and just uh, work through any any negative feedback or any any concerns. I know Castaways was was operational for uh, a short time under our ownership after COVID. It was it was a massive undertaking to to get that open and to operate it the way we did. And uh, after these closures uh, from COVID, it just uh, the attention did did shift a little bit, and. Um, it is it is a massive undertaking. We've been trying to figure out what the absolute best use is for the property, and uh, we are leaning towards towards cannabis for that use. With a, a small twist, we're we're happy to go through the special permit process, put together our plans, get the floor plans updated, security plan, staffing, whatever whatever's needed. Um, and uh, but yeah, happy to answer any concerns or questions or. Right. And at this point, since the state is not, uh, they have a pilot for consumption lounges. At this point, you're looking at just a dispensary. Just looking at a dispensary, we would, if there was a way to, um, you know, if there, uh, if there was a way to, to, to subdivide the property and subdivide the building and, 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 and be prepared for some type of on-use consumption, or if there was a way to opt in yeah. and and come to terms that that made sense for everyone, we'd 
we'd be happy to do that. And we, we'd figure out and work with the town in the most responsible way to do it. Some have definitely opened. I haven't heard of any, any issues. Um, but mm. as yeah. far as, uh, yeah, just trying to, the path of least resistance almost yeah. for us. <laughs> Understood. When you say some have opened and there haven't been any issues, do you mean uh, cannabis consumption sites or uh, topless cannabis consumption sites like you're proposing? Uh, no, as far as I know, there's there's no there's no topless cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts. I'm not I'm not sure if any exist in the country. Okay. Um, as far as far as the on site, I think there are some places that are operating in in a gray area. Um, I'm not, I think that maybe in Worcester, some places have actually opened and we just, we haven't heard of any, any traffic incidents, any crime. So kind of the, the major issues uh, that, that people think of when they think of on-site consumption, but um, there was a way to, to structure a framework to roll it out responsibly. I mean, we would, we would be open to that, mm -hmm. but the, the priority is is a simple transfer of the, the cannabis license that's not operational now um, to 226 State Road, complete a, a nice renovation on the building, get it set up properly for uh, cannabis retail, mm -hmm. and continue somewhat with uh, kind of a, an open spirit there and, and, and do something that, that really hasn't been done. Um, there are a lot of dispensaries open do you think you need a, a niche to to be successful? A lot of people have got licenses, but but haven't opened. Licenses are, are sitting now, um, but we we do think it's it's the best use for the property. Of course, I have to ask, who's going to be topless? Who's going to be topless? Yeah. I, I, it may surprise you, but there's a. Uh, we, we've never had a shortage of, of employees who want to work at, at Castaways. Oh, and, I'm sure. I'm just asking. And, uh, yeah, and, and, I, I, and I, I, I do think uh, some of our former employees that we've worked with would, would love to be involved with something like this. And we, we, we're confident we could create the protocol to, to create a safe working environment like we did at Castaways, the, the short time we were operational. And I, I think we can come up with a framework that, that works uh, and, that, and that, that drives business to the site. And just, just come up with a, a management protocol that, that, that makes the whole concept uh, a win-win. I know nothing about um, Castaways and your business model and uh, in safety, et cetera, from the past. I, I'd love to see that um, prior to. I, I, think, I think there's actually weekly meetings that are on the record where I had to check in, I think once every two weeks Amy's or so. Nodding. Amy's nodding. Yeah, okay. I could, okay. I could so call. There's, there's, we, we, have a, we have a track record of following the process and, and, and uh, yeah, we, we, I think we have a, a good track record for what that business is. It is a very tough business to operate. It was uh, our first uh, endeavor into, um, you know, full nude strip club where we're serial entrepreneurs, always trying things, always uh, making real estate investments. And, um, you know, my, my partner's on the phone now, but he, he has two dispensaries opening up. One's in, in Boston. I forget, I think the other locations may be in Lynn. Um, but, yeah, so we, we do have some experience on the cannabis side and some experience on, on the nudity side. And I just, I think it's going to be a great idea, honestly. If I was just not to hold back anything, I, I think it's a great idea. I think uh, people will be intrigued. I think people will, will come. They'll, they'll, you know, it's cannabis tourism. And I think it'd be a fun place for the, for the right person to work. It's not, it's not an environment for everyone, but... I, I do think we replace, a, you know, full nude dancing, kind of this, this nightclub scene and alcohol with something that I, I think is, uh, is, is a, probably harmless, harmless in comparison, so. Could certainly be a little mellower. 
Say, say, I'm sorry, say again? It could be a little mellower. A little mellower, for sure. A little mellower and more predictable, which is, is always better. Um, more predictable than anything. Would this require yeah. your continuing to hold the entertainment, the adult entertainment license, or would you be letting that lapse? Uh, truthfully, not not entirely sure on um, how the licenses would would come into play. I know we've we've spoken with Tom Lesser, who will be working with us on this, if um, if we decide to to move forward for the special permit. But I I do think in in some way we might have to keep the, a, a component to the entertainment license and and change it from from full new to just topless. Nick, but there'd be no dancing or no alcohol. I can chime in here. Um, hey. Yeah, so we, we'd amend the entertainment license to be what's there, which would be a new retail, I'm sorry, topless retail service. And then we'd remove dancing from the entertainment license. Uh, and I think as everyone knows, it's renewed every year. So, you know, we wouldn't have an entertainment license for an, an uh, endeavor we're not doing there. So. Okay. We're dancing. We're dancing. Will be removed. That would then be stricken from the entertainment license at that point. And that was uh, Julius speaking a moment ago, right? That's correct. Yeah. The entertainment license is still, or some form of entertainment license, still required for the top lift element. I believe right? so. I believe so. I think generally, even the TV requires. Uh, presence on the entertainment license, so um, the, new, the topless portion would still be on there, I believe. I think that's the part Nick's saying the lawyers could probably opine on that better, but my understanding is the entertainment license will say topless say, uh, retail sales, if I had to guess, or something along those lines. We'll have to think of something else to call you besides the Waitley Ballet. <laughs> yeah, there'll be there'll be no That's more sure. there'll be no more ballet. It'll be over. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. But really, I think the I think you know I, I I think I came on a minute or two late, but you know the idea here was to just have an open discussion about it before we yeah. put more time and effort and other people's time and effort into it. So I don't know. Uh, it was more yeah, of an open. And I think when, when we've got firmer plans, we'll have to revisit the various requirements, but I know we're put on both the, the, the building and uh, security at the, at the time when you purchased several yeah. years ago. Yeah, I sort of feel like at this point, I'm not sure that we really have much input to make. I mean, you've, you've presented the idea, and so I, I want to say you've been heard. Um, the, there's a lot of legal questions, like what exactly is this license about? Um, and those aren't quite answered yet. So I guess I would say you have probably mission accomplished. You've got us, you know, you, you've updated us on what your plans are. Um, it's not, I don't really have any opinions to offer, you know, on, on anything in particular, clearly a lot of things have to get revisited. But I think we're sort of, as far as I can tell, we're, we're, I don't have anything else to say to, to give you feedback on really uh, having just heard the idea now, you know, little rattle around, but you've got a lot of other things ahead of you that you've got to um, get through before any opinion of mine is going to make any difference. Well, just I don't even know what my opinion is at this point. So sure. Well, well, that's fair. That's uh -huh. fair. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that part. I think we're just looking conceptually if it's something that could be entertained in the right parameters. If if I had to oh. say what we were thinking about, uh, you know, because then we're just having meetings and everyone's taking their time to listen to it to us, and mm -hmm. you know, there could be more pressing things for the town, you know, rather than listening to us once uh -huh. a month for six months, something like that. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, just trying to be clear. You know, otherwise. You know, we're, we're making plans to open and just trying to foresee the next year, I guess. So 
that's all. But I understand. I mean, we just presented it. I don't expect you to have a formulated yeah. opinion on the matter. So understood. Okay. I'll circle back actually for a second because initially you said you want to open in the next 60 days. Is that yep. correct? Correct. As, correct. As, as castaways as it currently is? Yes. Correct. Okay. And then you want to transition to a different operation. Yep. Okay. That's correct. I just wanted to make sure I understood. Thank you. Okay. No problem. Okay. okay. Well, thanks a lot. Really appreciate yeah. the time. Thanks. Yeah, thank thank you. Is it, thanks for coming to the meeting. Thank you. All right. So right now, um, next on the agenda is uh, uh, Dale Kowaki from the De Franklin Regional Retirement System. Is uh, is Dale on the? I don't see Dale's name, but it could be. Oh, I, there he is. Dan, right there at the bottom. Thank you. Lot. Yeah. So Dale, we're a little um, ahead of schedule, but if it's okay with you, we can go right ahead. Oh, sure. I'm usually a little behind, but I like being a little ahead now. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, uh, yeah, we had, uh, we, Brian brought us the idea of this voting on a 2% COLA increase for retirees in fiscal 2023, and we didn't really have enough information. So maybe you uh, can walk us through what the story is here. Um, typically, uh, the board votes a 3% COLA increase for the retirees each when you year. Say the board, you don't mean us. No, there are other boards in this world. It would be the retirement board. The retirement <laughs> board. Okay. So just uh, be so, clear, because because uh, a lot of people will just take what you said to mean that we've done it. You know, people watching this meeting who may not right. know. Right. Um, so for them, the, the retirement system is run by a five-member board. Uh, and I work for them. I'm the director for the retirement system, but I work for this board. Uh, and annually, the board is presented with the option to give up to a 3% cost of living increase to all the retirees. Um, there is a limitation on, um, they're limited to just the 3%, except for this year. Uh, they also are limited to a, what we call a COLA base or a COLA maximum where uh, they're limited to only up to the first $17,000 of somebody's annual retirement benefit. And so if somebody so what, is- what does, can I, Sorry if, I, if I'm interrupting. So what does that really mean? If someone has a retirement benefit of, let's say double that, $34,000, then when the retirement board um, gives them a 3% COLA, it's only a 3% raise on the 17K, which brings it to higher than 17K. So then the next year comes around and you're always calculating whatever COLA on just 17K and the rest of it never gets any kind of COLA. So in that particular case, it'd be effectively a 1.5% COLA instead of a 3% a COLA overall. Is Am I understanding any of that right? Perfectly accurate. That's exactly oh. the way it works. Um, it's limited to the seventeen thousand dollars year after year after year, unless well, unless the board votes to increase it uh, another thousand dollars or two thousand dollars or three thousand dollars. There's a yeah. provision in the law that allows them to increase that cola base. Yeah. But right for the last uh, seven years, it's only been seventeen thousand dollars. And so you're right. When somebody is getting a retirement benefit of $34,000 a year, they're only going to get a $510 increase um, based on the $17,000. Mm -hmm. And if somebody is getting a $17,000 a year uh, retirement benefit, they're also going to get the 510. Okay. Hmm. And do you happen to know, like, is, is 17,000 like a, a typical retirement? Um, benefit or pension i'm not sure what the right word is there um that's pretty much the average right now i think the average is just a little bit more than that oh, okay for, for our for our beneficiaries okay all right um, 
And as far as across the state goes, um, we are one of the highest as far as that limit goes. There are there are a few that now are 18,000, and there's a couple more that have caught up to the 17,000. Uh, but for the longest time, many of them were 13 or 14 or 15,000. Mass mm -hmm. teachers and uh, state highway workers and police, state police were limited to just 12,000 until just a few years ago. And then it just went to 13,000. So that's how we stack up with the rest of the uh, Massachusetts retirement systems. Sure. When somebody gets a benefit from social security, they get a, a cost of living increase from social security. It of course is on the full amount of their annual benefit. So if they're getting $30,000 a year, they're gonna get that three percent on the full full thirty thousand. Boy, is that a strange system? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, to explain it away is that uh, we're trying to fund the retirement, and if you were to start giving out a larger cola, um, you would have to include that in your funding cycle, where it would be added. Every two years, we have an actuary come in who will calculate the total retirement load that we have for the next 40 years. And so all the people who are members currently who um, would likely be getting a benefit would be included in that calculation. And so if you start to assume that they're going to get um, a 30,000, they're going to get 3% on 30,000 you're going to be adding to that liability expense. Yeah. At, at this point, we're still an unfunded, we're not fully funded. We're about 75% funded. Um, and so you're, when the towns are paying their assessments, they're having to pay towards that unfunded portion. And so you're, you're kind of trying to catch up. Yeah. There's, a, there's an interest figure involved in there because you're not paying it all in one year, you're paying it out over the next 15 years. It's kind of like a mortgage payment. And yeah. so there's gonna be some interest added to it. And so the board remains sensitive to increasing the assessments too much. Their goal right now is to become fully funded uh, before they start to increase the COLA base, uh, before they start adding much more for benefits. This being an unusual year, as far as uh, cost of inflation, um, the state legislature voted to allow retirement systems to add on an additional 2% for a total of 5% for just this one year. Um, it also is subject to the secondary approval by the select boards of the 24 towns who are members of the retirement system. We do have, we have school districts who are members of the retirement system. We have fire and water districts. Uh, we have two housing agencies that are members of the, the retirement system, but they're not included directly in this approval process. It's just the 24 towns. And so at this point, we've had eight towns who have uh, eight select boards who have voted to add on the additional 2%. And we have uh, 16 more to go. I was a little confused about the 2% just for this year versus some discussion in our previous meeting that none of us were entirely certain about that sounded as if we add the 2%, is that gonna be in perpetuity going forward? Well, always, in, go ahead. Is it always gonna be five then? No. Okay. So, so the, annual, the annual COLA increase going forward, unless the legislature does something new and exciting, uh, we'll go back to we'll go back to the three percent that's allowed by law, and so it really is this one year that would give them a five percent cola boost. Okay, but, if, but then you pay that out over the course of many years. Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah, because if you give if you give somebody an extra five percent um, to their retirement benefit, that's going to be added to it over the years. I mean, you're still get, you're still going to be every time you give somebody more money in their annual benefit. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's going to be there in the future years. It's not going to suddenly go away next year and you start all over again. So you add three percent, you add three percent, you add three percent, you add five percent, you add three percent, you add three percent, and oh, so it'll, it'll yes. compound. Yep, yep. Okay. Right. Thanks. Yeah, but uh, it compounds in a funny way because, like anything that puts you over seventeen thousand, it's going to be kind of a, you know, that part is not going to compound anymore until they raise the seventeen thousand limit. Right, right, right. So it's a, it's a weird kind of con it's not like a straightforward Excel spreadsheet that I can do compounding. That, uh, <laughs> I've, got, I've got a couple of questions on the approvals. Uh, if the town approves the two percent, is that for the town or is that a vote towards the entire district? Entire system. That and are the Votes of the various towns weighted by size, or is it one town, one vote? They are not weighted. It's uh, one town, one vote. Okay, so the, but this, so this will not come into a thing. You say there are 24 units or you know, towns involved. So when you get the 13th town to approve, then it kicks in for everyone. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, Dale, make the case for why we should say yes. Um, I'm not really here to convince you one way or the other. I'm here as the, the person who knows um, all the answers to the questions. It really, oh, okay. um, I, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not here as a salesman and I, I don't necessarily think the board um, is trying to sell you on it either. The board's approach was, um, they would like the towns to be able to say whether they want to do this or not, because ultimately it's going to add to the town's assessments. And so it's an expense to the towns that they're going to be incurring. Um, the board generally has been supportive of retirees and giving them uh, increased benefits, particularly when it's limited to the 17,000, particularly when it's limited to the 3%. You know, in a year, in a year when uh, the CPI is 9% or 8%, they're still limited to just the 3%. Over the years, what I've done for the board is I've kept track of um, how our retirees do in comparison to a social security retiree as far as um, getting uh, getting the same amount of so getting the same amount of COLA benefit over the years. Uh, and up to a few years ago, uh, Social Security was ahead of uh, the retirement system. Uh, but then over the last couple of years, the retirement system was able to do the 3% on the 17, whereas Social Security was limited to 1.2 or 1.3. Uh, and so we started to catch up with Social Security. Uh, at this last year, I think was the first year we were a little bit ahead on Social Security. Um, and so this year now, um, with the uh, Social Security cost of living, I think it was 8.2%. Um, yeah, yeah that, it's, so it's, it's a nip and tuck. And at this point, Social Security is a little bit ahead of the retirement system. So we're, um, we're right there. It's, it's uh, quite comparative in that way. Um, if the CPI and the Social Security COLA continues to be more than the, th the 3% on 17 that the retirement system can give up, then the local Social Security retirees are going to be getting a greater COLA than the government retirees. And so the board, is, the board has always kept, a, kept their thumb on that pulse as far as um, if we if we have taxpayers in these towns who are going to be funding these assessments for these uh, retirees from their highway department or police department, um, we don't really want to be causing them a greater expense than um, they can afford 
through their cost of living increase with their, from their social security. And so the, the board tries to keep it um, comparative in that way. The case, so the case for giving them the additional 2% this year is that it helps them to keep up with social security colas. Yeah. And yes, if I understand you right, the mechanism by which they got caught up was that we had a period of low inflation. Um, so during the period when the inflation was below 3%, the board, that is the retirement board, not us, um, voted 3% raises on the, granted on the 17K, uh, but that was still enough to help get caught up. Correct. Okay. And the, the catching up with Social Security is still only on the base annual benefit. It's not that anyone who's earning greater than that is going to be substantially under the, and it's still going to be limited to 5% for them on the amount over 17,000. Correct. Up, up to the 17, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. That 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 those two those limits will still be in place the three percent and the seventeen going forward or the five percent in this if you if the if the towns approve it it would be five percent for this one year so it's not suddenly opening the floodgates and uh, pouring down cost of living increases on the retirees it's it's just another little uh, a little boost to them in this year when the Social Security cost of living increase was much greater. Right. And for yeah. someone who's right at that 17K benefit, the increase, oh, I don't have my calculator out. Um, you said something like $500-ish increase. That would be if you have the 5%? Um, for for I'll get my three, calculator out. For 3%, mm -hmm. it's $510. Okay. And for the 2%, it's an additional $340. Okay. Mm -hmm. So an additional $340 a year for someone who's on retirement income. Okay. Yes. No. Have you had any boards vote against it yet? We have not. And I'm, I actually, I have to personally say I'm a little surprised about that. I would think that there would be some who would say, gosh, we can't quite afford this right now. Uh, uh, but so far it's eight, eight out of eight. I guess I would attribute that to the math is pretty clear and and um, that we're not trying to break the bank or open the floodgates. It's really just trying to keep up with Social Security, stay stay uh, stay in uh, reach of them, uh -huh. and have you know have it be uh, equal for all neighbors, regardless of where they're getting their retirement from. Um, I th think that's probably been the reason that these eight select boards have said, yeah, we, sh we should do this. Brian, can I ask you a question? Yellow. <clears throat> sure. Uh, how, and I guess Fred, because you're more involved in finance than I am, um, how would we determine as a town if we can afford this? <sighs> I'll let Fred take that one. No, just kidding. <laughs> it sounds um, like it would get folded into the budget numbers and, uh, you know, if it's approved, we'll, you know, we'll see where yeah, what, what comes making, at the other end. It's not making you go, oh, my God. Do, you, do we have any idea how many oh, weekly employees yeah. Yeah, or beneficiaries are involved here. Um, I, I don't. I don't. I'm at home, so I don't have that number with me. I don't know what your number is. I certainly I could answer it if I were in the office readily. But yeah, Brian, do you happen to know if this includes our teachers? Are the Union thirty eight teachers in this? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, I can. Yeah, I, I thought they were in a different um, retirement program. So I was gonna. I would think it'd be something like five-ish. I mean, we don't because we don't have a lot of retired people from 
Uh, so you're holding up five fingers. Is that what you're saying, Dale? No, I'm, home. I'm, I'm raising my hand. <laughs> oh, please go right ahead. Uh, so Mass Teachers um, is also getting the extra 2%. The legislature oh. vote, voted to give the Mass Teachers the extra 2%. Um, the, the school system does not pay the retirement assessment. I believe it's paid by, isn't it paid by the um, state government? Now, it's, it's you, you, you would hope that that would be something I would know, but for some reason, I think that, um, I know that the FERCOGS retirement assessment is paid by the state budget. And I almost think that mass teachers, I almost think that the school systems don't have to pay the retirement assessment to mass teachers. Does anybody have a hint in their head about that? I think I, that I sounds like a crazy a system. Item. So we probably have that what's going on. So <laughs> I, I don't recall in the last couple of years seeing a line item in the school's budget for it. So yeah. Yeah, same here. Um, so so this would be this would be the expense that would be more direct to the yeah. towns. Um, yeah. And I think every penny you spend, you have to, you guys are, have tight budgets. I don't know where you find the money every year to, to fund the stuff that you want to yeah. do. And you mm -hmm. usually have to do, do without something. Right. And but if it's, a, yeah, so if it's $300 times five retirees, that's different than if it was all the teachers who are retired out of the school, that, that'd be a substantially larger number. So right. if I had to estimate that we have something five, say double that 10 retirees getting benefits this year, then that's 300 times 10, $3,000, hmm. maybe on the, on the upper end of what uh, we might pay out extra this year. Or oh, that it actually gets paid out over time as we're trying to catch up here. So it, it, it may be that for us, it's not as big a cost. But in any way, anything we do would be a kind of a spitball estimate. Um, well, we do have an estimate, Brian. Yeah, Brian's Brian, frantically so making an estimate there. No, Brian, <laughs> Brian, if you go back to my original email that I sent out to everybody from the get go, um, I believe I included in there the estimate from our actuary. Oh. And boy, did she say it was going to be? I forgot what she said. And I think I actually, you know what? And I think I did. So Joyce, I think our actuary said it was going to be an additional $264,000 a year um, added to the oh. overall actuarial valuation to the assessments. And then I took that and I applied it to a chart that um, shows how we divide up the total assess. Say we have to raise $8 million in a year. Um, we then divide that up amongst the units based on their salaries, their annual, their five-year, a five-year average of their annual salaries um, as a percentage of the uh, total salaries for a weighted the average, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, if Waitley were one percent of that, then that would be two hundred and sixty fourth, two thousand six hundred and forty dollars yeah. per year for your assessment. Does that sound about right? Yeah, Brian was trying to say something there earlier, but I think he was muted. Yeah, I have the I have that email. Let me just scroll down. Yeah, I, I, I've got that chart here. Um, I think it was one of the things that confused us last time what the chart actually meant. Uh, it's headed added cost to assessments of an additional two percent cola, and it looks like Waitley's number is sixty five hundred and forty four. There you go. In FY twenty twenty six. Beginning in FY26, yeah, and it'll be that. So $6,500 each year from 2026. Uh, what is it, out 13 years from that? Uh, it looks like it's out nine years. Nine years. 
Okay. So, hey, there's there's the number then. Sixty five hundred bucks a year added to your assessments for nine years. Well, no, it's sixty five hundred in the first year, and then sixty seven, sixty, and then it goes up two hundred a year, roughly. All right. Beyond that. And that's the town wide assessment. And then do we do, okay, this is completely pulling it out, but divide that per citizen to see how much each person would be paying extra to support this. Well, the the 15, 1500 residents is $4 per person. Yeah, it's $4 per person. Yeah. Right. Which I'd be happy to kick in. <laughs> each, each, each year. Yeah. yeah. You guys are good at this. My only other concern was being a good neighbor to other towns around. Uh, I don't know. I can see that some of the towns have a, a larger, a significantly larger assessment. One would assume that they maybe have a larger budget in general and more populations. More, more, more retirees. Yeah, well, more retirees, but do they have the budget to carry those retirees. I guess. Presumably if they've got more retirees, they're bigger towns and that's what have, I'm going. Have, have larger budgets, whether they can afford it, I, I can't know, answer for them. That's what I'm going for is do they have typically larger towns, bigger budgets, et cetera. And so we really are just basing it on a percentage. Well we're basing it on a percentage assessment of retirees, but it do we extrapolate that right. to say that's also a percentage of the town's budget that's getting at it? Or is there going to be a town with a plethora of retirees and a very small budget that's going to be smacked? It's, yeah. it's unlikely that that smaller town is going to have that many retirees. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Yeah, I guess as far as like the like what how does our town benefit from that we do have a good number of people on fixed incomes here so i've been thinking of it that way um when our taxes go up they go up on everyone including the fixed income folks right so uh if some folks are i mean i'm not necessarily I'm, I'm not sure social security is um, is anybody's you know, glamorous retirement, but it's something that keeps people from being in complete poverty. So if we are, if it's really a, an argument to keep up with Social Security, then that might actually, it's not just a cost to the town on the budget side. There's also, I mean, if we were to oh. not do it, there's the cost to the town in terms of, you know, people oh. in the town not having that extra Three hundred dollars. Well, I, I also think that it would speak well of us to take care of these ex-town employees who put in a lot of years, yeah, work, working to get to this benefit, and not to let them fall further behind mm -hmm. cost of living. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting you say that, Fred, because uh, I'm getting near to retirement age, and. One of the considerations as to why I would retire or not is that if I retire, I'm only going to get a 3% COLA based on 17,000. If I keep working and my board gives me a 3% COLA, it's going to be on my full salary. And so it behooves me in some way to just keep working because I don't necessarily want to take that hit. Uh, in the boost to helping me um, keep up with inflation. And yeah, so you have, you have retirees out there now who are faced with that in that, how do we get them enough money just to keep up with a gallon of gas and a loaf of bread? Exactly. And the people who are on retirement now don't have the choice that you did of on retiring and going back yeah. to work with a coal on right. old salary. Yeah. 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 And they should start considering electric cars, because electricity is cheaper than gas. But that's sort of not on our plate to vote on. Um, no. Are we voting on this? Is this a vote? I haven't heard a motion, but I think we're probably getting to the point I where- 
that we uh, approve as the town of Waitley the 2% COLA increase for retirees in fiscal year 2023. I would second. Okay. Uh, great. Mo moved and seconded. Um, let's go to a vote then. Uh, Julie. Yes. Fred. Yes. Joyce. Yes. You have okay. your ninth town. <laughs> Congratulations on being the ninth. It's a nice round number. Three, three, three. All right. Hey, I All enjoyed right. well, my Dale, thank you for taking the time to thank come you. see us. Um, I enjoyed my time with you. It's always a pleasure to get out and see my people. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Well, now we were ahead and we had so many questions. We're a little bit behind now. Um, our next item is the folks from Toro Verde to uh, discuss the host community agreement for 424 State Road. Um, and nobody has Toro Verde on their name tag, but I assume at oh. least some of the people here, maybe Phil or Taylor or both, are here oh. for Toro Verde. Is there anybody else? There's a PJ and a DA. PJ as well. TJ is PJ as well. Yep. Yes. Okay. And DA is our like our district attorney is watching this. Like, what is that? Not sure. Okay. All right. <laughs> Maybe. All right. I, just, I, I know who Judy is. <laughs> DA is muted at the moment. Yeah. DA is muted, probably laughing their butt off at us. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, maybe um, then I can. Uh, uh, make, Phil's got a big smile on his face. Maybe I'll start with Phil. Would you like to tell us more about what we're uh, what we're doing here with the host of community agreement? Sure, you're asking of us. Sure, I've got a quick little presentation. If we can just put it up for everybody, if that works. Um, can I share screen my screen? Well, I'm not in charge of that. I'm okay with you sharing the screen, but someone else actually has that power, not me. Brian Can I go ahead and share, Brian? You have to give him a minute to make you a call. Um, yeah, one sec. Okay. Yeah. Amy, you're the host, right? I believe so. May I have to make co-host correct? Yeah. Done. We're all set? Yep. Awesome. All right. Let me try that. Oh, we love what your happened to your audio? Yeah. Phil, your voice went down really low. Is your okay? Oh, there you go. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, okay. Good evening, everybody. My name is Phil Silverman, and I'm actually representing a company called Nectarize. And what we're trying to do, Nectarize is trying to purchase ownership of Toro Verde 3, uh, which is in the process of finalizing construction of an adult use marijuana retailer at 424 State Road, uh, otherwise known as the Sugarloaf Shops. Um, and I'm here today, we have Taylor Lovejoy, who, he represents uh, the, the current uh, Toro Verde 3, um, and, and he'll be here to answer any questions you have. I'm also here with PJ Patel, uh, he's the owner of, of Nectarize, and, and he'll be speaking to you as well. But uh, we're going to sort of, we, again, what we're talking about is, is the intent for Nectarize and Mr. Patel to purchase the ownership of Toro Verde and essentially uh, get that, that project open. Um, so let me just sort of recap a little bit of where we are. Um, and it, I never thought I would have to clear this, but what we're looking to do as a marijuana retailer, our employees will have their shirts on, just so you all know. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. just, just to- Phil, Phil, can I ask you a quick question? Sure. Your screen has your slide is like a little teeny tiny thing in the middle. Okay. Is there any way you can make that slide look bigger on your screen? Oh, that, there you go. Did that do wow, it? Oh, even yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a little bit better. Now it's covering about half the. Yeah, yeah. there we go. All right, uh, great. I, I'm Thank not you. great with technology, but hopefully we can get through it. Um, so again, this this is uh this project the Toro Verde does have a provisional license with the Cannabis Control Commission. That's in good standing. It's already been permitted uh by the town. 
Uh, I would note that it appears based on your zoning, we probably have to come in and renew that um, that permit. So we'll be doing that, assuming we can we can go forward here. Um, you know, so so that is uh, something in the future. But but the renovations uh, of the building uh, are nearly complete. And, you know, we would expect that if if uh, if we're approved and everything moves forward, we would be uh, having Cannabis Control Commission inspections in the next two to three months. Um, so, again, just to summarize, we're proposing a transfer of 100 percent of the ownership of Torre Verde. Uh, which uh, will go in the name of Nectarize LLC. We we executed a purchase agreement in January. Um, and then Toro Verde will continue to hold the host agreement. It will continue to hold its permits. It will continue to hold the CCC's retailer license as well. Um, and Mr. Patel is the 100% owner uh, of Toro, will, will be the 100% owner of Toro Verde through Nectarize. Uh, and the sole director and president as well. Uh, and we have already asked uh, permission from the Cannabis Control Commission to accomplish this transfer. Uh, obviously, it is it is subject to local approvals and, and having all of our permits uh, done as well. Um, and, and just uh, for the information, uh, Nectarize and Mr. Patel are also acquiring two other uh, retail cannabis dispensaries in Northampton and Greenfield. Um, and this is uh, PJ. PJ, if you could, if you could unmute yourself and maybe just sort of introduce yourself to everybody here, if that's possible. Sure. sure. <clears throat> hey, guys. Uh, hi. Nice to meet you guys. Uh, thank you for taking your taking the time to come in on uh, the call, and thanks for inviting me. Uh, I mig I migrated to this country in the '90s. I moved to Massachusetts in the early 2000s and uh, was attended high school in Norwood High. Graduated in Norwood. Uh, high school class of 2003 went to johnson and wells university in providence uh rhode island um so i have my northern roots um city of, state of massachusetts has always been my favorite states i've moved around a lot i actually moved to florida and i know everybody likes to move and they're called snowbirds but i don't like massachusetts uh, florida anymore so <laughs> i'm looking forward to starting my journey to moving back to good old mass uh, i've been in retail for all my life uh, migrated my family started convenience stores, hotels, motels, convenience stores. Uh, so I've been in retail all my life. Uh, went to college. My father gave me my college fund, got my associate's degree. And then I decided, hey, it's just a piece of paper. And the funds that he had saved up for me took my first convenience store and started building my business ventures. So you could say I'm a high school college dropout, college dropout only with an associate's degree. And I'm able to um, I was blessed with all the experience with my family and my father's experience, and I'm a successful entrepreneur, and I'm looking forward to starting this uh, Toro Verde 3 operations going as soon as possible with the blessings from you guys and, of course, the CCC. Great. Thanks, PJ. Um, so this would just be uh, a timeline of, you know, how we uh, expect to get this open. Uh, again, it's a little bit aggressive. We're at the mercy of the Cannabis Control Commission in terms of, you know, when they do their inspections. But the hope is um, that if if we can proceed here, uh, we would be uh, basically opening uh, in May of 2023. Could be June, could be July, but we're aiming for May. And, and it's not, uh, it's really not unrealistic. Um, so that's, uh, that that's the, the sort of the the summary of what we have what what um i guess what i'm trying and, and i want to sort of explain what it is we're requesting here because it's kind of it's kind of hard it, the host community agreement says in it that if you are looking to transfer an interest in the hca uh then the town needs to consent it's not clear to me that what we're doing is transferring an interest in the hca What's happening here is where there's an ownership change. The HCA is staying with Toro Verde. So I, the, pro, the proper legal interpretation is that we probably don't need consent, um, but I didn't want to take a chance with that. We wanted to be you know, out in the open and disclose to the town what was going on. If you prefer to consent to it, that's fine. I don't think you have to, but I sort of leave that to the board uh, in, in what it thinks is the best best way to accomplish this. So, you know, as I said, that that's what we're seeking is either 
uh, either you can just say thank thank you, uh, Mr. Patel. We you know we have no problems with what you're doing. Or if you'd like to have a vote uh, and consent to this, uh, considering it a transfer, that's fine. Uh, but it's whatever the board's pleasure is, and we're happy to answer any other questions you might have, whether it's for us or uh, uh, Taylor is here. If you have questions about Toro Verde, anything uh, you want to ask. I, I've got a question on the HCA. Yep. Has, I haven't been on the board long enough to know. Brian, you may know, has the town uh, reinstated, uh, you know, updated the HCA or is the 2020 document the only HCA document we have? Um, that, that document, the, um, well, I'll bring it up right now. The amended or stated yeah. The amended and restated HCA has been um, extended twice, so it's still okay. cur it's currently in good standing. Recent, um, I believe, back in December. That's that's the one that we actually okay, signed back I in December. I just yeah. want to make sure because there's a clause that says it lapses. Yeah, they've stayed on top of that. Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Um, looks like I've got a hand up and from Judy. Go ahead, Judy. Yeah. Um... I noticed that the timeline didn't involve any local permitting and a change of ownership requires a new special permit. Yeah, I, I and I, a special I, permit requires that an HCA be, be signed. Yes. So, um, and so it, this will require going to the ZBA and approval of a special permit by the ZBA, just so everybody is aware of that. And since they only meet once a month, that might take a while. Understood. We uh, one of the first questions I asked when I spoke to to Brian uh, was was you know that requirement, and we do understand that we have to go in front of the ZBA. Of course, he would know that. Uh, we did a walkthrough of the facility, the build out, over a year ago. Now, are you planning? major changes from what that build out looks like no the 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 plan is to go with what has been presented and what was previously approved uh I, it, it, it's conceivable there might be some minor changes to the floor plan um and so we would obviously talk to uh the zba about that but i don't see any kind of significant changes being required here exactly so we, we did a walk through and there were you know countertops and it was safe room and you know everything was essentially built out yep a year ago december yep it's it's really a turnkey it's it's very much ready joyce can i ask a question sure go ahead brian um if i remember correctly the the re the retail establishment isn't going to take up the entire portion of the of the red building. Are there plans for additional uses within that building, or is that sort of to be determined? I we only have one unit. Okay, it's unit A one, so that's going to be a retailer. I don't think we don't we don't have any lease interest in, in the rest of the building. Okay. So if I'm reading this HCA correctly, uh, the second amendment to the amended and restated host community agreement, this is extended through December 31st, 2023. That's the lap state. That's, yeah, uh, that's the what? The lap state. The lap state, okay. At which point uh, Nectar Ice will be looking for another HCA? If, if they have not, so if they have not received their special permit, uh, not special permit, if they have not received their final license with the CCC, then they would need to renew the lap state. The, the expiration of the HCA is, um, I believe it's 2025. All right. All right. I'm in 2025. So the lapse is only relevant to if, if they don't receive their they don't receive uh, license. the final license. And then, okay, thank you. Yep. Well, it sounds like, I mean, I don't have any objection to your sale to um, PJ. And um, I don't, I mean, it sounds like there's some ambiguity as to whether 
we need to transfer this HCA. Um, but a vote to transfer is what you seem to be asking for. Is that a fair well, statement? I, I, I don't think we need it, but if the board, sometimes I've, I've been around uh, the state and we've seen this kind of language. Some boards think there's no need for it in this circumstance. Others yeah. just want to consent to it. Uh, we're happy either way. Right. So again, no you're saying the reason you don't think you need it is because you're not transferring the from from eight from Torre Verde to um, Nectar Ice. Yeah, it's the, the HCA stays in Toro Verde. You, so there's a change of ownership of Toro Verde, but there's not a change of, uh, well, own, uh, ownership's not the right word, I guess, but there's not a, a change in the actual entity with which we made an agreement. Yeah, the, the change the, of ownership does trigger some things, as Judy pointed out. Correct. Right? Correct. Um, but the, but but the entity that held the HCA mean, holds it still yeah. and, and since you say that some municipalities say you needed their permission and some say they don't i assume there's no case law on this yet there isn't it's a matter of uh interpreting you know your own hca yeah i'm inclined to say let's cover our tail portions and just say you've explained to us what ha has happened and we'll and I would move that we agree. Um, that, yeah, um, Brian, how would you suggest we yeah. we word whatever we are I voting on? A movement. We understand what's happening and we're okay with it. Um, I guess that, well, I, if you put it that way, it's a little bit diff, uh, difficult, but because it's the transfer of the HCA to Torverde three to Torverde yeah. three, but um, that we approve the uh, HCA to remain with Toro Verde under new ownership, under new ownership of the limited liability Toro corporation, Verde. something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But we kind of uh, understanding. I mean, this is recorded. It's going to be available. This is part of the public record that. Um, it's not settled whether you really need us to approve of anything, but uh, I appreciate that you, you know, came and informed us. And um, I mean, I, I I have no reason to stand in the way of someone, um, you know, getting uh, a nice, getting a, a business going. We've been waiting for a long time, actually, <laughs> for this kind of thing to happen, for something to be happening, especially in those the sugarloaf shops. So. Um, does it actually have to, Brian, do you think have to be something that uh, it goes into the agreement or can we just make a vote that's on the record? On yeah, the I think, public record? yeah, I think it would just be a vote on the public record. That would be, be fine. Yeah. Okay. Can I move in a more formal way? <laughs> yeah. Um, hmm. I, I move that we uh, understand and approve the continuation of the HCA for Toro Verde 3 uh, under Toro Verde 3's new ownership by Kati Patel. Did I get the name right? I didn't have it in front of me. That's great. Yes, second. Okay. Moved and seconded. All those in favor? Julie? Yes. Fred? Yes. Me? Yes. Okay. All right. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Appreciate Thank it. You. You're very welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And thanks for coming in and, and seeing us. Thank you. Let's get it open. Yes. <laughs> we will. <laughs> we will. We will. <laughs> All right. We are now on page two, folks, and we've got another 30 minutes or so. I think we can do this. Uh, so next item on the agenda is uh, COVID-19. It's kind of a standing item. The only item in that category is that there are rapid tests available at the town offices for free. So come and get them, folks, if you need them. 
Um, and moving on to old business, um, we have the item about installation of water meters at town buildings. And maybe Brian has some updates for us there. Um, I do. I was hoping the water commissioners could come um, to the meeting tonight, but they were not oh, available to come. Oh, that's right. Uh, um, so that. um, I do have asked. I did receive estimates from Wayne in a in a in a letter. To, I guess it was from the commissioner uh, letter from the commissioners today that they'll be t they'll be uh, attending the meeting on the 28th to talk about. OK, so we'll table that item. Sounds like OK. Yeah. All right. Oh, that was fast. Okay, next item is to discuss next steps with the Waitley Center School. Yeah. So my understanding is we didn't get any responses to our RFP. Correct. So we don't have any decisions to make about which RFP we should uh, we should look at. Um, so we, we, have we, we, have, we have someone here who wants to comment. Okay. Uh, Where is Sure, it's Donna Wiley. We were sitting oh. here asking about how to get your attention. <laughs> <laughs> no, they, I mean, Fred is the vice chair, so it's perfectly reasonable for him to do that. That's why I facilitated it. So Fred is assisting me. Um, uh, you want to know why I am? the record. Donna Wiley, 184 Chestnut Plain Road. Um, and although I am a member of the Historical Commission, I'm here not speaking uh, formally on behalf of the Historical Commission because our meeting is next week and this item appeared on your agenda um, just last week. Um, so I, I want to say a couple of things, that maybe I have three different things to say. Um, and, and I'll do the background first, um, just to remind everyone that we had a, um, an ad hoc committee that spent nearly a year looking at the center school just before the pandemic, I did not serve on that uh, committee, but they issued um, a very good report, which if anyone hasn't read it recently, we now have posted on the Historical Commission's um, page mm -hmm. on the website, and it is a useful, I think, to review. Um, I, I want to address um, specifically, Joyce, a uh, comment that you made, um, which actually repeats the comment that you have made several years ago when this subject first came up, that you um, believe that a viable option is to demolish the building and make a park on that uh, property. Um, the building is a defining structure in a National Historic District. Um, and we all know that, and I'm not going to bore you with a lot of words about that. Um, but I'd like also to say something about the subject of demolition, which is that when we demolish a building, we put tons and tons and tons of concrete and slate and glass and wood. Wood deteriorates. The rest of it is just in the landfill. So I think given the amount of attention that this town is putting, increasing attention, and I'm pleased about that, to environmental concerns and climate change, we need to take that into consideration before a sort of casual comment about demolition. Um, on the subject of a park, uh, the ad hoc committee did not recommend using that property for a park. They did comment in a sort of postscript that if there is an interest in establishing a public park in town center, the town owns seven acres on which the library sits that is protected. It has a lovely hill if it ever snows again, it would be nice for sledding um, that has available parking. Um, and I at least would concur with that committee's opinion that if we want to park, we should be talking about that property. But I'd also like to remind everyone that we have had a, a very thorough job done in 2021 on by the Open Space and Recreation uh, Committee. That's a very long detailed um, report with many, many, many recommendations. We engaged about 120 town people in a survey and in various focus groups and a park appears nowhere in pages of recommendations about how many space that is available in town. I'm not opposed to parks, 
but I think we have a lot of people in this town give um, time to thinking about this kind of issue, and we just shouldn't forget that. Um, on the building, I agree with those, and I know Brian is one of them who have said that our decision, and I think this was the recommendation of the ad hoc committee, to limit um, the ability of applicants to reply to the RFP to a leasing arrangement mm -hmm. presented a really serious obstacle. Um, even in 2019, we were talking about a million to a million to in basic structural repair, getting the systems in place. Uh, I'm not going to hazard a guess, but we know it would be more than that now. We know also that there would be many um, advantages to working in historic building tax credits and grants, and um, the historical commission has to get it to help whoever wants to save the building get them those benefits. Um, but I would encourage the select board uh, to allow some time so that we can think about whether we can issue a new RFP um, with sale of the property as desired outcome and have enough sticks and carrots in place to make sure that it remains the center school, that the exterior remains um, as close to its current state as, as possible. Um, we know that that's what town hall, we might have to make some exterior changes in order to uh, advance accessibility issues. Um, I think that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Don. I want to pipe up and say that uh, at a previous meeting, I had volunteered to contact Natalie Blay, and I have not yet been able to do that uh, due to a sudden influx of work. Also got an interesting email from Judy Markland uh, with uh, information. I think it, I believe it was Judy, wasn't yes. it? Yeah, Judy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. With information um, about funding sources, and I haven't really had a chance to review that yet. Hello, Kitty Cat. Um, so I agree very well, very much with uh, Donna's request that we put a pin in it and look at a variety of options. And and I do think that the fact that we were looking for a long-term lesser um, was essentially saying, please take on our money pit. Yeah, it's something of a shot in the dark. It was, yeah, an it was worth trying. Which... Yeah, it's worth trying, and it didn't work. And it didn't work. So um, I think the visioning will, committee understood that as well. Yeah, and I will commit to prior to the twenty eighth meeting, I will review the email from Judy Markland, and I will have at least one, if not two, contacts with you. Let Judy, Judy give her brief description of her note. Yes. Yeah. yeah did you want to speak, Judy, or did? Well, I sent. I sent uh, yeah, I thought Julia. You sent it was a list. You said she was going to contact Natalie, and I wanted to make sure she understood the research that the committee had already done about yeah. things that were already available, and they were mostly historic preservation and historic tax credit things. Um, since that time, I want to point out that the especially the new Healy administration is really pushing affordable housing mm -hmm. or house, housing in general. And um, I forwarded, I think to everybody today, one grant opportunity, but I, my guess is in the next six, 12 months, there are gonna be a zillion possible grant opportunities for housing. And I wanted to note that when Joan Switzit, in, in the select board's wisdom, they did not give the visioning committee a budget. And I think we turned out a pretty good report without a budget, but we didn't have a budget. Joan Switzit did a sort of high level feasibility study and recommended that place, the school for housing um, primarily because of the 
smaller parking requirements and the fact that there was less accessibility. The housing didn't require the, the full level of accessibility upgrades that a business use would. And I'm thinking that over the next six, 12 months, there are gonna be many, many more grant opportunities for housing for other uses of historical buildings. And I, I second the recommendation to just take this slowly right now. I, I think Thank this you. just also calls for us to make sure we hire the community development coordinator sooner rather than later yeah. to yep. assess those potential right. grant opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's how that will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have anything else to chime in with at this point? Mm -hmm. yeah. well, we need to talk about this. I just don't know if there's anything that we're prepared to further talk about at this point. Yeah. As, yeah. Far, as far as definitive steps. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I, I don't know what to do with it either. But I'm I'm open to I'm open to any 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 kind of thing we might try. Really, that's not gonna, um, you know. There's, I mean, I don't want a McDonald's there, but I'm pretty sure that's off the table. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I I, I you know. I acknowledge what what Donna said. I certainly have in the past said, "Hey, you, we could consider this." But I, I hope people listening aren't thinking that um, I'm just drooling over the thought of demolishing a historic building. That that's not the case. It's not the case when I spoke of it in context at the time. So just to make that clear, I think I have had access previously, and I probably filed it away someplace smart. And uh, to the visioning committee's report and the Jones Witset report, are those, if I can't find them in my files, are those available? They're, they're on the historical commission's webpage. They and are. The visioning committee's report is there. And the Jones Witset is one of the appendices. I'm Excellent. not Thank remembering you. the number now. It's actually, you know, I think for, I, I'm reading over it. I'm very impressed at that report. Hmm. Anyway, I was part of the committee, so I shouldn't take credit. <laughs> well, if you're part of the committee, you should take credit. There you uh, go. Joyce Donna was uh, raising her hand again. I, I, um, go ahead, sorry, Donna. I genuinely don't, because I don't think there's a camera. For the administration. There is now that you are speaking. Now that you're speaking. Yes, there it will be. Is it? There it is. No, oh, it's on me. Sorry. So um, we have the center school on the historical commission's agenda for Monday. And one of the things that I would like to do uh, is for us to discuss um, that question of carrots and sticks <laughs> to a potential investor, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a separate issue from the list of eligible uses. Um, so I would simply like to uh, promise you that we will get back with some recommendations about that for your consideration. Yeah, I think it's exciting to speak for all of us to say we'll be wide open to any recommendations to give us some action steps to work with. I, yep. um, and this is totally anecdotal, but you know, you may not know that Sunderland um, wrung its hands over its ten hall, town hall for 10 years before Debbie Snow and her partner bought the building and made it into the Blue Heron. And it's not the same building and it's not the same location, but these things do take a while. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the only issue is we're paying... Well, we're paying... We're paying... Less, yeah, we're... <laughs> Paying four thousand dollars a month and not thirty, which was the other thing that was said at that meeting last month. No, we're paying ten thousand dollars a year. 
is the cost. There's the uh, insurance is $4,000 a year and the uh, just basic services to the building for keeping it warm is 6,000 or I might have those numbers backwards, but it's basically total cost to the town of keeping the building shut and not being used uh, and keeping it minimally uh, functional so that it doesn't fall apart. Although it is of course deteriorating is $10,000 a year. Yeah, I didn't realize that. I know the electricity is turned off and I thought the water was turned off and all the faucets opened. Oh, but it's we, like, uh, the, know, yep, yep, there was a, a pipe break, uh, I think in the last couple of years. And uh, they, we have to have, have insurance on it and we have to have some heat in the building or else insurance. there'll be more damage. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not advocating a 10-year delay. I'm just here. Well, really so. An example. <laughs> right, right. A 10-year delay costs us $100,000, but it's over 10 years. So it's a small, it, it's a, it's like a drip, 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 right? And, you know, so for example, from various solar farms in, in town, there's a solar farm where I think we get about that much in revenue. <laughs> so, or, you know, it depends on which size farm it is. Well, I'd really like to be able to put the $10,000 towards doing something that actually helps people. So to me, I, I feel like we want to we want to get something out. I understand what it will take is a community development director <laughs> to get another RFP out or to do the work on getting grants. And I agree, housing our restaurant would be great, but we haven't had anybody coming in being interested in either of those. Mm -hmm. So it may just be a matter of how we package it and market it mm -hmm. and find finding the right message. It may be also a matter of finding out more about the actual structural integrity of the building and the septic. I, I think all that's been done, Judy. I think well, <laughs> not by the visioning committee, I'll tell you. Yeah, I don't we think don't, that was we their, don't their know remit. the actual state of the roof. And I don't believe anybody's tested the septic system. No. Oh, sorry, Brian. No, I just I just wanted to just chime in for a second. I, I think the <clears throat> so when we we did the we did the RFI process or before the RFP process, and we had a good number of I would say we probably had five, six, seven people interested in the, you know, that showed up to take the tour of the building and to check it out during the during the RFI process. Um, my opinion is that is that what was unattractive for the previous RFP was that it was that it was a lease situation, um, which requires you know if the whoever the the lessee is, you know need if they're think if they're looking to make money off it then they need to you know run a business that turns a profit plus, you know to recoup their investment if the town's willing to part you know part with ownership of, of the building. Maybe that there's a, a historic preservation restriction that that remains, you know, for the exterior of the building. I, I think there might be interest in the in the school. There might not be, um, but I think the the least part of it was what was the least unattractive part. Um, and I, in my my understanding, I, I think the vision and committee's first preference was that the building not be sold. Um, so I think that's sort of why we went that route. And I'm, so I guess that's the next question is, is, is there a willingness to part ownership, part, part with ownership of the property on behalf of the town to, to see that, you know, that building reused? Um, yeah. So I think that's a question that we'll have to sort of grapple with. And maybe the historical commission wants to think about that too. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And once you part ownership, you don't really get to have control over what happens. So, or the other alternative being, we start mining for grants and and try to get the school into a state where maybe it is something that can be short term. You know, there can be short term leases, but then there's a whole bunch of other issues with maintenance right. and being a landlord. But um, I right. see those as really the two viable options. Um, or the other third one is what. Donna doesn't want us to do so, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure which way to, you know, which way we want to go with that. I, I can't really speak for the visioning committee, but I think given that, that the town tried, 
in my opinion, the fact that the town tried the leasing option and it didn't pan out, I don't think that the committee would stand in the way of, of it selling it yeah. for a constructive, for a usable purpose. I mean, uh, one of the, the, the zoning restricts the, the usage pretty, pretty carefully. So, I mean, it would have to be an office building or a, it could be a cafe, it could be, but the, the zoning is pretty tight about, about, about the possible uses. So I don't think that's an issue. Okay. Right, so as it is, Judy, I think it is true that as it's zoned currently, um, even with the exception that we granted, um, it, the sale of alcohol or cannabis is not allowed. Is that, am I correct in that? Yes. That doesn't mean that there couldn't be a, you know, a change made for the company. Um. I would think it would be very hard to get a special permit for that from the ZBA in the center of town in any event. Yeah. All right, well, it sounds like the, the Historic Commission wants to have a little time to think and come back with some ideas. So maybe we can close this discussion at this point and look forward to having maybe the Historical Commission come and chat with us some more at a, excuse me, at a future meeting. Unless Julie or Fred has more to, to add there, or Donna or Judy. I, I was just going to say that I, 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 I'd like us to have more than one discussion, but I don't see any reason that we can't get back to you in March. Okay. All, so, all I'm I, sorry, it's the end of February. You know, all all I would yeah. say is to ask Chris if he writes an article about this meeting to put something in that we're, we're still open to any ideas from the public about right. <laughs> how we might proceed on this. <laughs> All right, write that article there, Fred. <laughs> right, okay. All right, sounds like we're okay with moving on to yeah. um, the new business, which is to review, discuss, and potentially vote on whether to sign the right of first refusal at the congregational church. So this, I don't think I understand very well why we're being asked to do that so maybe brian can explain a little bit sure so um i believe it was the last was the last annual town meeting last special town meeting there was a town meeting where that was a special special town meeting special. right mm -hmm. special town meeting approved the uh the use of cpa funds for um window restoration on the congregational church and part of that um article included really there's there's two things in the right in the in the document that you're being asked to sign on behalf of the town was that there be a covenant that if the windows don't comply with the um secretary of interiors uh historic standards that the church would repay the cpa funds and the second part was that um the church would provide the town with a right of first refusal um if for the future sale of the building um so those were the two conditions um that the article imposed for the for the use of those or the whatever we want to call them, the use of the CPA funds for the church. So this is just an execution of that of those two conditions. Okay. So we're doing the will of the people. The will of the people. Yes. Always. And it's signed by the lawyers. As written by the yeah. There's a sale pending. It's the if ever. Right. If ever. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. The covenants for a period of twenty years. Right of first refusal is in perpetuity. Uh, okay. All right. No questions. No okay. questions. Okay. I would entertain a motion then. Who, if we approve the covenant and right of first refusal agreement with the uh, for the church, uh, first congregational church? Second. All right. All those in favor? Maybe I'll mix it up now. Fred. Yes. <laughs> Julie. Joyce, yes. Okay. Uh, select board liaison updates. Uh, timely updates from select board members serving on other boards and committees. Um, let's see. Um, I, I don't mind starting out. 
I'm, uh, I'm on the Board of Oversight for the South County Senior Center, and right now we're trying to get all of us over at one point for a tour of the Congregational Church in Deerfield and uh, to as if that could be a potential home sometime in the future, should there ever be uh, a point when that can be brought uh, kind of into, I'll, call, I'll say, compliance with uh, with health regulations regarding various problems with the building. That that hasn't happened. We have not had a meeting either in the meantime. Um, but uh, uh, so there's no no movement there. I am also on the personnel committee, and the personnel committee we have um, we've made some recommendations that'll work their way through to the finance committee and uh, to the select board. But we've uh, recommended raises for various folks whose um, salaries were lower than the median and uh and we recommended a uh, it's going to sound really really high but a 7.1 percent cola and a personal committee recommends it doesn't mean it's going to happen but uh, the personal committee was kind of doing their duty as the people who say this is what should happen we don't get to say what will happen so that's uh, that's all I have to report. Um, Fred, do you have anything to report from? Uh, just interviewing sessions next week for both the treasurer collector position and the fire chief position with whatever qualifying resume, people submitted qualifying resumes and I'll find out when I get those, exactly how many people we have for each. Okay, cool. Uh, the Climate Resilience Committee had a public meeting. Uh, was that the choice? You and I were both there. Yep. The second of February. I think so. A small number of community members attended, uh, confirming for us our suspicion that the best place to drum people up to attend committee meetings is, in fact, the transfer station. Uh, <laughs> And they stayed the whole time via Zoom and with some good input. Um, there is a, another community meeting, I believe, uh, 6.30 here at the town offices on Monday, February 27th. Anybody interested in attending and learning about climate resilience in Waitley is welcome to attend. And we are focusing on water. Can't live without it. Yeah. Okay. All right, sounds like we're done. Brian, do you have some uh, town administrator updates? Yes. Um, Fred took my first two, so I can't talk about those. <laughs> um, no, I only took treasurer, collector, and fire chief. I didn't take. That's true. You didn't take the other one. I didn't take the other one. <laughs> um, we're still, uh, we're, the position is still open for community development coordinator, um, assistant town administrator. We've had um, three interviews so far, and we're still sort of um, thinking through, you know, who will be the best, who will be the best person. Um, there's one more interview scheduled um, for next week. So um, that's, we're probably getting the most applications for that position compared to um, the other two. Um, there was a um, municipal aggregation meeting that happened, well, a Zoom meeting that happened today to talk about um, a future municipal aggregation effort or a continuation of the, the effort that's ongoing now. Um, so I believe when we did the original one, Joyce, you're, I think you're the only member that is still on, that, right. that's still on the board. Um, so maybe at some point we'll have ask the energy committee to come and maybe talk about the process. Um, yeah. so, um, municipal aggregation is the idea that we can aggregate the electric load of, of the people in town or the willing people in town and we can get a, we can get a, a more competitive price. Um, and we do it on a region wide basis. So we hope to get an even more competitive price. Um, colonial power is the. Um, I think the broke the energy broker, I guess we would call them. 
Um, um, yeah, they're the consultant. And I don't know if they're the broker, but uh, they they identify the companies that are willing to sell us what we want at a good price. Right. Yeah. Um, they were saying today that that this this contract that the the, the the towns in this area had done was one of the best that they've ever seen in terms of in terms of timing and, and in terms of cost savings. Mm -hmm. um, Cause we, we went out to, so we go out. So essentially um, there's a coalition of towns who we go out to bid for power. Um, and it's for, uh, I think we went for a, was it a three? We had a little six month window or something in the beginning with, was it three and a half years or whatever it was, two and a half years. Um, I think it was three and a half years. Yeah. Oh, I, um, I was thinking it was five, but I, yeah. But uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's time to renegotiate the next one, I guess. Right. Yep. Um, so that's what it is. We'll, we'll hopefully go through that process, assuming the select board wants to do that. Um, but the savings was was pretty good. I think we were around nine cents per kilowatt hour the first year and maybe 10 cents when Eversource was the basics, you know, the basic service was. I'm not even I don't even yeah. remember what it was, yeah. but it was significantly higher. Um, so we'll have to go through that same RFP process. Um, so I, I'm, I'm thinking we should probably invite the energy committee to have the conversation about what it is and, and you know, our yeah. experience with it. And we'll have to do the authorization. Uh, I think last, last time you authorized the town administrator to sign the agreements, but we had sort of this joint meeting once we got the pricing. Um, yeah. The, when we get the so we get the pricing and it's it's real time and we have about two hours two hours i think to make a decision um so right. we can talk about that more at a at a future meeting but right yeah yeah it wasn't quite as as stark as that in reality because they were sort sort of able to tell us well in advance like days in advance what, <laughs> what we got we the indicative pricing seeing. right what what the what the pricing was really going to be so we actually had a chance to talk about it and say well look if that's what it is, then this is we're happy with that. And um so that it, I think uh it's worked out really well for our town. Um you of course have to wait and see what what ends up on our plate. But our I've got nothing but good things to say for the the folks at Colonial who uh, helped us get that. They they seem to know their stuff. They uh, at one point it was in it was after the pandemic started, they said, I have never seen the energy prices go down like this. Let's do it now. And they were right. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and they know a lot about the, the cyclic nature of the prices. So they, we, we've done well with that. Um, it, will we get a lower price? No, probably not. But will we still get a better price than uh, our other alternatives? Probably yes. Um, and and certainly, if you look on a year-round basis, it's a constant price over across the year, not one that goes up and down seasonally like like the uh, Eversource does. So, clarify for me: is this for town buildings? Is this for residences? For residents and uh, the town, I think uh, the municipality can anybody who lives in Waitley or any building that's in Waitley. Uh, you can be on this municipal aggregation. I believe the town buildings are. Yep. I believe 90% plus of people in town are mm -hmm. on the municipal aggregation and are quite happy with it, given how much um, we're saving compared to what compared to what our choice is, which yeah. would be uh, for most people ever source. Yeah. Cool. Uh, um, and lastly, um, the capital improvement planning committee is wrapping up its work. We need to do a quick final meeting to prioritize a couple projects. We had a site visit at the elementary school um, to to think about the and talk about their air conditioning project that they're uh, proposing, as well as they're continually uh, replacing flooring at the elementary school. So um, we'll have recommendations out of that committee um, soon for the finance meeting select board to to think about also one of the things that and this would be a question for the select board is that last year we i guess i'm not going to say a question but last year we used the um some of our arpa money to fund a number of the capital projects um we still have over three hundred thousand dollars left in arpa money um so that might be an idea that you might want to consider again as a use of those funds and that allows us to 
um, you know, save free cash or, or move. It, it allows us to grow our, grow our savings essentially. Um, but that's a question for further down the line. Um, that's about all that I, well, one more thing. Um, I had a, um, a call with, um, Berkshire Design Group, who are who is going to be doing the the exit thirty five planning study, um, and we were talking about the project, and we thought it might be good to get sort of a, um, uh, I guess sort of a stakeholder committee together, uh, or or you know someone that they can bounce you know ideas off of and have conversations with, um, which hopefully could include some members of of the community within the area. Uh, maybe some of the business owners, but also maybe a member of the planning board and a member of the select board. So I know everybody's itching to, you know, have additional <laughs> assignments, but I'm wondering if there's any interest in anybody um, to. When does it start? Um, I said that I hopefully have the committee together by the middle of March. It's going to, it's going to be very informal. I think it's, you know, I'd be curious. I'd be willing to nominate you. Be a strong baby. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So probably by uh, at our next meeting, we'll have to actually yeah, decide that yeah, one of us will step up like to do that. Next meeting, like a yeah, I'm I'm happy to talk about it more offline too, if okay. if you want. We, we'll we'll talk about it. All okay. right. Okay, you guys arm wrestle whatever you need to do. Yeah, but can we both lose? <laughs> <laughs> That's like, yeah, it could happen. I mean, I mean, we could always we could have we could always have more than one select board member. We we just I guess have to officially post the you know post any meetings, but we wouldn't right undertake any real business. I guess shut up and just listen. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I'm I'm actually very excited about the about the work because I think that's a yeah. part of town where 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 it's uh, it's uh, underutilized I think in yeah. terms of you know economic development and things like that. So yeah. I think there's I think there's a lot of opportunities there that 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 aren't being taken advantage of. So yeah. I think it's good. Cool. And that's it. I'll be quiet. Okay. But I, I I enjoy hearing from you, Brian. <laughs> well, we're at our two minute our yeah, two hour mark. We so. are yes, we are a few minutes past eight, which means that's that's why I'm feeling like I I need to rush this on. Uh, it looks like we're at the end of our agenda. So I would I would move to adjourn this meeting. Second. All those in favor, Julie. Yes. Fred. Yes. Joyce. Yes. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.